Hello and welcome everyone to the CC Partners webinar entitled COVID-19 a month later. Over the last month and a bit, we have all experienced a number of changes and effects to our workplaces and our personal lives. And we wanted to get together and discuss some of those changes from the perspective of employers. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, CC Partners is a law firm that practices only labor and employment law and we only act for employers. With me today are my partners Susan Crawford and Mike McClellan. We are also thrilled to be joined by Jacob Angamir from MNP. MNP is a leading national accounting, tax and business consulting firm in Canada. And Jacob is a partner in the Taxation Services Group. So he's gonna be able to address various issues with us uh, with respect to the government assistance programs that have been enacted and are in the process, some of them, of being implemented. So without further ado, I will start the presentation. There you see our presenters and you will get contact information later. Here's our agenda. We've done the introduction part. We're gonna talk about leaves of absence. We're gonna address how you respond to COVID-19 issues in your workplace. And of course, the government support during COVID-19. The question and answer segment uh, will be recorded separately and available. And this recording as well will be available on the CC Partners YouTube channel, as well as links provided on our website and we will do our best to distribute any and all of the information, uh, including answers to questions after the webinar. So without further ado, Mike, over to you to discuss leaves of absence. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction, Kelsey, setting the uh, setting the scene for us. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about leaves of absence this morning. Um, and in particular, we're going to take a look at Ontario's Employment Standards Act. That is the legislation that sets out the leaves of absence to which an employee is entitled. Obviously, the other jurisdictions throughout Canada have their own employment and labor standards uh, legislation. Um, but we'll, we'll use the Ontario uh, legislation as as an example and um, also because that is where uh, we expect most of our uh, listeners are um, coming from um, so a couple of things that we want to keep in mind uh, the legislation we have gives the employees the right to access certain leaves but I, I do kind of want to stress also that there is nothing preventing an employer and employee from making their own agreement with respect to a leave of absence for the uh, for an employee during this time uh, it could be a useful tool and an alternative to um, more more drastic uh, means of staff reduction such as uh, layoffs or terminations so first thing we're going to do is take a look, look at uh, what is provided by the employment standards act we're going to look at some of the existing leaves of absences. We're gonna take a look at the new leaves of absences that have been um, enacted through amendments to the act in response to COVID-19. So let's take a look at the Employment Standards Act to start off. So the Employment Standards Act in Ontario lists 14 different types of leave of absence. All of these leaves of absence are provided by statute. They are unpaid, but they are job protected. And what we mean by job protected is that unless an employer has just cause, an indefinite term employee cannot be terminated while they are on a statutory leave of absence. Uh, and keep in mind, because it is unpaid, if an employee takes access or gets access to their leave of absence under the uh, act, an employer really has nothing to gain by putting them on, on a layoff. 
Uh, you're already achieving what you need to achieve during this time, for example. The employee is not being paid unless there's an agreement uh, to pay them during a leave of absence. Uh, and their job is protected. So they don't have to worry about losing their job uh, during the leave of absence. In some cases, layoffs can be converted to job-protected leave of absence under the Employment Standards Act. But that's going to depend on the timing of the layoff and when the employee becomes eligible for the leave. So that's kind of an overview of what the Employment Standards Act provides in terms of leaves of absence. I want to look now at some of the existing leaves of absence that are not COVID-19 related, but may apply in the workplace today. So the Employment Standards Act in Ontario sets out the statutory leaves of absence under Part 14. And as I said, these leaves of absences do not have to be related to COVID-19 to apply. So these are going to apply to uh, the workplaces on the government's essential list that remain open. They're also going to apply to those workplaces that are not deemed essential workplaces, but where employees can still work remotely. So examples will include pregnancy and parental leave, or family medical leave, or family caregiver leave, for example. So employees still have the right to three unpaid days of sick leave under the Employment Standards Act. They still have the right to three unpaid days for family responsibility leave if they need to be absent due to the injury or illness or some other urgent matter relating to, relating to certain relatives. They're still entitled to two days of leave for bereavement. A family medical leave still provides up to 28 weeks of unpaid but job protected leave for an employee to care for a family member who had a serious medical condition and are at a risk of dying. This is, Family medical leave is also meant to be kind of compatible with EI, compassionate care benefits. And also family caregiver leave, very similar to the family medical leave, but there's no uh, requirement that the family member being cared for is at the risk of death. So these are all leaves that are still in play, still applicable to every workplace that's reg provincially regulated in Ontario that are alternatives to the leaves that require uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, but like I said, there are a couple of amendments, recent amendments to the Employment Standards Act that are directly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's take a look at those now. And what we're talking about are the uh, emergency leave for declared emergencies and infectious disease emergencies. Those are under section 50.1 of the Employment Standards Act. This section was recently amended sorry, recently amended as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So declared emergency leave was already in the Employment Standards Act, uh, but it's been tweaked um, a little bit to include the infectious disease portion of the leave. So in, a, in essence, when a state of emergency is declared in the province, and as a result, an employee is unable to do the work, they would qualify for emergency leave due to a declared emergency. An example would be that an employee is out of the country, a state of emergency is declared for Ontario, the employee is not allowed to travel back home to go to work. That would be a case where the emergency, declared emergency leave could apply. Of course, pending things like whether the employee could work remotely. So currently it would seem to apply to employees in workplaces that the government has not designated as essential and who cannot work from home. Now, very recently, the Ministry of Labor uh, published and distributed its new Employment Standards Act Policy and Interpretation Manual. That manual gives a slightly different interpretation. Uh, it seems to be kind of counterintuitive and contrary to the program's normal interpretations of the provision. So we're going to hold off and, and wait for some more clarification before saying that the way most lawyers are interpreting this statute is, is not quite correct. In the current case, a state of emergency has been declared, and as a result of orders made under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, many workplaces are ordered to be closed. It is our opinion, and it seems to be consistent with the purpose of the Employment Standards Act, that an employee affected by these circumstances would be entitled to have their job protected by declared emergency leave. Another aspect of this provision is the leave for infectious disease emergencies, which is obviously something we have right now. 
the Ontario government passed a regulation to the Employment Standards Act listing COVID-19 as an applicable infectious disease. So employees are entitled to a job protected leave of absence if they are prevented from working because they have COVID-19 or because they are caring for a family member with COVID-19. It would also apply if they're under isolation, quarantine, or observation that requires them to be absent from work, even if they don't have COVID-19. And if, if an employer chooses to send the employee home or not allow them to attend for work because there would be a risk to other people in the workplace if the employee were to attend, such as coworkers or customers, that employee would also qualify for the job protected leave. Now, a common reason for the leave will be where the employee has children who need supervision and care because their daycare or school are closed. Those are circumstances in which an employee can access the new infectious disease leave as well. As I said before, though, although we have certain statutory leaves available under the Employment Standards Act, there is nothing preventing an employer from granting an employee an unpaid and job protected leave of absence in the circumstances. And even if there's some controversy about how the declared emergency leave should apply, this is still an option that's available to reasonable employers and employees just to say this isn't the right time to be at work. So uh, in the circumstances, the best thing to do is just take the, take the unpaid leave of absence. The employee can apply for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And as long as we're being reasonable and, and acting in good faith, this is a viable option as well. Certain things are not currently protected leaves for employees. Employees can't insist on leaves of absence in all circumstances just because of COVID-19. For example, if somebody subjectively thinks that work is unsafe, that is not an entitlement to a leave of absence under the Employment Standards Act. And their recourse would be a work refusal under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, whereby they report why they think the work is unsafe, the employer would conduct an investigation, and if there is still disagreement between employer and employee about the safety of the workplace, the Ministry of Labor would then get involved and conduct an investigation. So there is recourse under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, but a subjective feeling that work is unsafe is not in it, does not it in itself entitle an employee to a job protected leave of absence. So in a nutshell, that wraps up what we know about leaves of absence under the Employment Standards Act. And I'm going to kick it back to Kelsey uh, to, to take us to the next portion of our presentation. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Susan's going to next address what some of the issues work, uh, some of the issues employers have been dealing with in the workplace and how to address those on a go forward basis for both those workplaces who are shut or operating from home, reduced capacity, so on and so forth, and those essential workplaces as well. Uh, Susan, over to you. Thank you so much, Kelsey, and thank you, Mike, for setting out uh, the new leave provisions and how those impact workplaces uh, during the COVID crisis. So apologies to our participants. It seems like we might have had some technical difficulties uh, and had to stop recording for a moment, but we're, we're back on. And uh, I was just starting to discuss how employers respond uh, to reductions in, in business as a result of COVID and the leaves that Mike just set out. And I've divided my discussion between non-essential and essential workplaces uh, because, of course, in Ontario, uh, there is that distinction being made in the emergency measures uh, procedures that have been set out by the provincial government. So dealing first with non-essential workplaces, um, important to remember that non-essential workplaces uh, can still operate as long as they do so remotely. So you can't be physically opened as a workplace, but if your employees can continue to work safely uh, at home, uh, and you continue to be productive, then you can still continue your operations. And because non-essential workplaces uh, are covered under the emergency response, we are recommending to employers that employees not be dismissed during this time period. 
unless of course you have a, a case you believe that there's cause for dismissal and cause for dismissal would be some serious misconduct on the part of the employee in question. So until we get through the crisis uh, to the extent that employers can avoid uh, dismissals, that is what we are recommending. We don't want employers to be back uh, before the Ministry of Labor uh, trying to defend why they were dismissing employees who may have had job protections under the, uh, under the emergency legislation. And so what do you do as an employer uh, in a non-essential workplace if you simply cannot continue to keep your employees working full time? And what we're trying to avoid here is a constructive dismissal. And a constructive dismissal is when an employer, although they don't intend to, they make unilateral fundamental changes to the employee's uh, employment terms such that the employee can treat their employment as being uh, terminated for all intents and purposes. And so while you don't intend to do so, uh, if you do things like making major changes to remuneration, hours of work and things of that nature, in normal times, that would uh, create a constructive dismissal uh, situation and employees can then choose whether they want to treat it as a dismissal or condone the change. Uh, but as we're all aware, we are not working in normal times right now. And so in terms of advice that we're giving our clients, we are, um, we are suggesting that you know, these extraordinary measures and extraordinary times mean that we may have to uh, make decisions as, as employers that we wouldn't normally make. So the first thing that is available to uh, an employer is a temporary layoff. And I'm gonna be focusing on the uh, Ontario legislation. Each of the provinces have their own temporary layoff provisions and many of the provinces have extended those uh, temporary layoffs uh, in response to the COVID crisis. And so a temporary layoff under the Employment Standards Act is not a dismissal. Uh, it allows an employer to lay off on a temporary basis uh, without triggering dismissal obligations under the legislation. And so in Ontario, uh, an employer can lay off an employee for up to 13 weeks in a 20 week period, or if they continue the group benefits or pension uh, entitlements that the employee had prior to the layoff, that period can be extended to 35 weeks in a 52 week period. The tricky thing with temporary layoffs is that our courts have determined in recent years that unless an employer has an employment agreement with the employee that has a specific right to lay off on a temporary basis or a policy or past practice of doing so, a temporary layoff can lead to a constructive dismissal. And now with that said, uh, I think most counsel that practices in this area would agree that COVID has presented uh, employers with impossible situations, particularly in non-essential workplaces where they've been deemed to um, be shut down unless they can operate remotely. And so we are advising employers that rather than proceeding with dismissals that they do temporarily lay off their employees. And so that is an option that's available uh, during this time. The other option that's available to employers is a work reduction uh, or a salary reduction. And again, for the purposes of a constructive dismissal, uh, a constructive dismissal is usually triggered in normal circumstances where a salary reduction amounts to an overall decrease in compensation by about 10 to 15 on the high side uh, percent reduction in total compensation. And that is on an annual basis. So given that we're dealing with something that's more temporary in nature, we are suggesting to employers that salary reductions of anywhere from 20 to 30% may be appropriate. Um, but we are seeing employers that are being required to do things like rotating uh, work schedules, so people are working one week off, one week on, uh, and making salary reductions based on reducing people from full-time to part-time, again, on a temporary basis. So that is available to employers. Again, must, must uh, reiterate that, you know, we're asking employers to do so with caution uh, and uh, to try and keep within those um, percentages that will not trigger constructive dismissal. Finally, uh, employers are uh, allowed to require their employees to use accrued vacation time. And so if your employees have three or four weeks of vacation, uh, you can ask them to use that during this time period uh, in order to, first of all, reduce your liability uh, when employees do come back to work. 
you don't have all of your workforce then off again for two weeks uh, for vacation time and as well to help ease the transition if you're not able to pay them uh, or they're not able to work full-time hours. Uh, and given that the uh, wage subsidy does require the 75% wage uh, subsidy that Jacob's going to speak about does require the employer to try and make up that 25%. We are advising clients that using vacation is a, is a completely appropriate way to meet those obligations. So that's the non-essential workplace. Uh, in essential workplaces, there are a couple of different considerations. Uh, the issue of temporary layoffs and using new time and accrued vacation, work reductions and salary reductions all remain the same. Um, employees in essential workplaces uh, are arguably not covered under the uh, emergency response protected leave uh, because their businesses uh, and their workplaces are allowed to stay open. Uh, that said, we are still recommending that dismissals take place with caution. This is not the time to clean house. Uh, I think the government's made it clear that the goal is to keep employees employed. Uh, and the reality is that employees will not be able to find work. And so employers who are dismissing and looking at what their obligations may be, uh, may find themselves having to pay significantly more because there was simply no ability to obtain alternate employment during the COVID crisis. So again, recommended with caution in terms of dismissals without cause. The other issue that we're dealing with a lot with our clients, uh, and Mike has alluded to uh, in his discussions, were dealing with employees who refuse to come into work. Uh, it is not enough for employees to just say that they don't feel safe. Uh, as as uh, Mike indicated, that is a subjective belief and if you as an employer have created a workplace that meets the requirements in terms of uh, providing uh, appropriate hygiene and providing uh, social distancing, an employee who refuses to come in who doesn't fit under one of the job protected leaves uh, does so at their own peril. And the appropriate response as the employer is to bring in the Ministry of Labor and have them deal with the work refusal. There are provisions under the Occupational Health and Safety Act that allow an employee to refuse work, but the Ministry of Labor has to deem that refusal to be reasonable. And we have had several clients that have had the Ministry of Labor come in. Uh, they do so virtually right now, so most of it's being done by telephone calls. And for the most part, uh, our clients are finding that they are uh, actually providing safe workplaces for their, their uh, employees. And so employees who refuse to come in on that basis, that's the appropriate way to, to handle that situation. Just wanted to say one more thing in terms of uh, these job protected leaves. As Mike indicated, these are unpaid leaves. And under the, um, under the uh, new legislation for infectious disease, employees are not required to provide doctor's notes. That said, if the employer has a short-term disability policy in place, and we've had a lot of clients ask these questions, if you're paying them under a short-term disability policy, you do have the right to require medical documentation in order for the employee to be entitled to that, that paid leave, as opposed to the unpaid leave. So keep that in mind when you're allowing employees to stay home, who are exercising those rights under that leave, uh, and still being paid for a significant period of time. Some of those uh, short-term disability policies uh, can be in place for up to 15 weeks. So that's, the, uh, that's where things stand in terms of how we deal with these issues. I'm gonna turn it back to Kelsey now to uh, move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Jacob, we're coming to you next, and I know you've got your own slides, so I've stopped the sharing there, and uh, you can take over. Uh, I will mute myself and uh, let you go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Kelsey, and uh, thanks, uh, CC Partners, for uh, having MMP and myself on to uh, talk about uh, all the various uh, changes and incentives that have come out. It's uh, it's been a pretty wild month or so. Uh, uh, updates uh, every daily from Trudeau. Uh, things have, have been changing. Uh, even even this week, uh, new new material has come out that has clarified some of these measures. So I'm going to go through uh, some of these uh, incentives and just uh, make sure that everyone's aware of what's available to them and uh, what you should be looking out for and what uh, what you can apply for. 
Uh, the focus of this presentation is mainly going to be on the 75% uh, the wage subsidy. Uh, that's the, the, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Uh, and we'll also touch on uh, the temporary wage subsidy and some other programs that were also introduced. Uh, again, just to make sure you're aware of everything that's, that could be out there for you to uh, take advantage of if, if you uh, need the support. So the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, uh, it's a 75% subsidy introduced uh, for businesses who qualify retroactive to March 15th, 2020. And generally it applies at a rate of 75% on the first uh, 58,700, so that's your max uh, EI insurable earnings. Uh, so the maximum that anyone can get per employee uh, per week is $847. I will go through the actual formula in a bit. Uh, currently, the program is in place for a 12-week period, and that's split into three separate four-week periods uh, from March 15th to June 6th. The legislation currently allows for that to be extended, so if, uh, if the crisis continues uh, for longer, there is the possibility that this will go on, but for now, it's just for this 12-week period. Uh, the legislation was released um, uh, last weekend, about a week and a half ago, uh, beginning of April, uh, and it's very complex. Uh, the calculations can become quite convoluted. Uh, there's a lot of criteria that has to be met. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do uh, is just go through it uh, and try to explain as much as possible uh, in two separate parts, uh, how much uh, you may be entitled to and how to calculate the subsidy. And then the second part will be who can actually claim the subsidy and how do you qualify for it. So that's the, uh, the meeting the revenue decline test, which we'll go through in a lot more detail. So this subsidy is very broad in terms of who is eligible to claim it. Uh, it's uh, eligible, if you're an el paying salary to an eligible employee, uh, which is really anyone who's working in Canada uh, and working for an eligible entity, uh, and they have to have not been without remuneration for 14 or more consecutive days uh, in each qualifying period that you're looking for. And for eligible entities, uh, it really covers everybody. Uh, anyone with a payroll account uh, who's an individual, a trust, a corporation, a partnership, uh, the, the only uh, in, uh, entities that does not that do not qualify are uh, crown corporations, uh, universities, any public body. Uh, other than that, uh, if you're paying payroll, you uh, may qualify for this if you meet the other conditions. So there's a formula that's uh, been determined uh, as to how to calculate this subsidy. Uh, and the biggest part of it is uh, part A which is uh, the actual amount of the subsidy. And then the amount you're, you can claim is reduced by two different amounts. Uh, the, if you've claimed any of the 10% temporary wage subsidy, which I'll discuss after, afterwards, uh, that reduces your claim to the 75%. So you can't double dip. You can only get a maximum of 75% per employee. Uh, if any of your employees are on a work sharing program, the, that also reduces the amount of the subsidy. So any amounts the employee receives directly for, as a payment of EI uh, comes off the amount you can claim for the subsidy. There's also a second component to the subsidy, which would reimburse employers for the employer portion of CPP and EI. And that's for employees that are on leave with pay. And I'll also discuss that in a bit more detail. So starting from the beginning, how is this calculated? As you can see on the slide, the, uh, the formula is very complex. Uh, it's the greater of the least of two different amounts. And it uh, really, if you're looking at this from a high level as to how much you can claim, uh, if you had an employee that you were paying in before the crisis, uh, you can claim up to 75% of what you were paying them before. Uh, to a maximum of $847 per week. And that is essentially the subsidy that you can claim. 
And I'll go through a numerical example that, uh, that walks through how this formula works. So say you have an employee that's being paid $2,000 a week. And because of the crisis, uh, you decided that and you agreed to uh, that lower, lower hours make sense and you're going to continue paying them $750 per week. So the first test you have to look at is what is 75% of what I paid them before? Uh, so 75% of 2000 is $1,500 per week. Now you compare that to the maximum you can receive, which is the 847. So 847 is less than 1500. Now you have to compare it to what you're actually paying the employee because you can never receive a subsidy for more than you've actually paid out. So since in this case, you're only paying 750, that's less than the 847, which is less than the 1500. The subsidy will be the $750 per week. So what does the uh, eligible remuneration include? Uh, really any salary, wages, or commissions that are being paid, and it has to be to an employee. So this is someone who's getting a T4 slip from the employer. Uh, independent contractors uh, do not qualify for the subsidy. It does have to be an employee. And the amount has to be paid in respect of the week in the qualifying period. So. It doesn't matter what your pay periods are. If you pay someone monthly, uh, as long as the pay is in respect of the qualifying period, you can use that as part of your calculation. You also can't pay things like previous bonuses relating to a prior period out and count that towards the subsidy. Bonuses for the period in, in question can be paid out and qualify for the subsidy, just not prior period ones. And the amount actually has to be paid between March 15th and June 6th. Uh, the uh, po a point highlighted in red there uh, just came up this week. Uh, a new, uh, new clarification from the government that uh, if you've laid off employees or furloughed them, you can actually uh, have them become eligible retroactively for this subsidy. As long as you rehire them and you actually pay them the retroactive pay before you include them in the subsidy. And you have to meet all the other criteria for qualifying for the subsidy. But that is good news uh, if you were looking to retro pay. Um, in a case where an employee would have been eligible for the CERB, uh, the $2,000 a month payment, uh, they may be required to repay that if this retroactive pay would disqualify them for that. So that's something that uh, the employee needs to be aware of and they may, may need to uh, send that check back in or re repay the amount. So what does remuneration not include? Uh, it does not include dividends. So any shareholders uh, that didn't receive payroll before and were only on dividends, unfortunately this program is not for them. Uh, severance pay, stock option benefits to also not uh, qualify. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, remuneration uh, paid uh, if the employer did not pay the employee for 14 consecutive days in each qualification period, uh, you're not eligible for the subsidy. And the reasoning behind this is uh, that's the criteria to claim the CERB $2,000 a month payment. So they do not want uh, employers getting the subsidy at the, in the same qualifying period that the employees also claiming the $2,000 a week. Uh, I will talk about how the CERB was changed that uh, individuals can now earn up to $1,000 per month and still receive the CERB. Uh, the legislation hasn't changed on the subsidy side. Uh, the legislation still says what is uh, no remuneration in 14 days. So, Technically, the way the legislation is currently written, you could pay an employee up to $1,000, get the subsidy if you otherwise qualify, and the employee would be entitled to the CERB. Uh, I just want to caution, if any, if any employers and employees are doing this and it results in uh, the employer employee being better off than they were before because you're, you're double dipping on both sides, uh, just, just to be careful, uh, it is the way the legislation is written, but uh, there are penalties for abuse that I'll, I'll go through uh, in a bit.
Uh, some other anti-avoidance rules that they've introduced just to make sure that there's no abuse of this subsidy program. Uh, if there's an amount paid that uh, you can read, the employer can reasonably be expected to be returned to them, uh, then it does not qualify for the subsidy. So a common example of this is if you have a shareholder who's also an employee, a lot of times you'll pay that shareholder a salary, but then they'll loan the funds back to the company for, uh, for working capital in the business. The way the rules are written, that would not be eligible for the subsidy. So any amounts paid as salary that you're claiming the subsidy on have to actually stay with the employee and be used by that employee and can't come back to the company. One further anti-avoidance rule is uh, relating to temporarily bumping salaries for the purposes of claiming a higher subsidy. Uh, so the test here is if you give someone a raise and then you're uh, reasonably expected to lower that back down to what they were making before, you, uh, you aren't eligible for the wage on that, the uh, wage subsidy on the top up. So just to try and stop artificial raises from, from happening. So I've mentioned this concept of what you were being paid before the crisis. Well, that's actually defined and there is a way to calculate what that is. And it is average weekly remuneration paid during the period from January 1st to March 15th, 2020. And if there's any period of time where an employee wasn't paid for seven days during that period, you don't have to include that period in the average calculation. And same criteria apply that remuneration has to be paid by an eligible entity to an eligible employer, employee to uh, be included in this calculation. And the, the main thing what this does is, uh, especially for individuals that are related to the company or the shareholder, uh, you can never receive a subsidy more than 75% of this average baseline remuneration. Again, these rules are, they are complex because they're, they're, they're meant for people not to abuse the system. So they have to put these rules in place to try and prevent people from doing that. So that is the, uh, the first part of the formula, part A. And as I mentioned that, once you calculate that subsidy, you reduce it by any of the 10% temporary wage subsidy you've already claimed, which we'll get to, and any work sharing benefits received by that employee. Uh, then there's that part D of the calculation, which is the refund of certain payroll contributions. So if an employee is on leave with pay, so this means that they're, they're not expected to work, but you're still paying them something, you're eligible to claim the subsidy for the employer portion of the CVP and EI, as long as that employee's salary qualifies for the wage subsidy itself. So that's another added relief. Uh, if your employees are not working, but you decide to pay them regardless, uh, this will be an added uh, benefit to the subsidy. So I just wanted to break in and thanks for clarifying that, Jacob, because we have gotten a lot of questions both from our clients and I know from attendees to this webinar about that kind of distinction between uh, leave with pay, eligibility for the wage subsidy, and this refund for EI and CPP. And I wanted to also ask, just for clarification purposes, when you're bringing people back, do you have to rehire everybody um, in terms of, you know, people might already be on the, the uh, Canadian emergency response benefit in order to be eligible for the wage subsidy? Do you have to bring everybody back? Uh, good question. And uh, it's been asked a lot by clients of ours as well. And uh, the legislation does not require you to bring all employees back. So it is, uh, Again, you have to consider the employment law considerations with what you decide to do, but uh, from a tax perspective and claiming the subsidy, uh, you do not have to bring all employees back to work. Uh, this test is on an employee by employee basis, and uh, you can have some on leave with pay, some on leave without pay, uh, some working with pay. It's, uh, it's really a, a test on for every employee and it's uh, up to the employer as to uh, what makes the most sense for their business. Thank you for that. And, and just from an employment law perspective, I did want to say that uh, obviously 
what it comes down to for employers is determining what makes the most sense for your business in any one situation. And if it's, if we're talking about what the uh, implications are with respect to refunds and wage subsidies, um, as long as you're aware of the implications from an employment law perspective with respect to the, the leaves that Mike talked about, or the potential for constructive dismissal claims and so on, um, you know, that's really going to be a case by case specific analysis for each employer and, and really you kind of need the, the two pronged advice of your um, tax slash accounting and bookkeeping people and your employment lawyers on that. So sorry, Jacob, I will uh, stop interrupting you and let you get back to your discussion. No problem. All right. So that sort of ends the first of the two parts. So we've gone through how do you calculate this subsidy and what are you, what could employers be entitled to? Uh, now we're going to go through the, well, how do I qualify for the subsidy to even get to that point of calculating the subsidy? So as I mentioned, there's, there's three different qualifying periods that have currently been introduced as of right now. And the first one beginning uh, March 15th to April 11th. So they're split into four week periods and you have to qualify for each four week period separately. So for period one, uh, there's a required reduction in revenue of 15%. And how you compare that is you can look at March 2020's revenue compared to March 2019, or you can look at March 2020's revenue compared to the average of January and February of 2020. And if you have a 15% revenue de decline compared to either of those periods, you are eligible to claim the subsidy for the claiming period of March 15th to April 11th. So the, the eligibility period and the claiming period don't match up. There's a bit of a lag on it. So just something to be aware of that the test is a little bit different than the actual claiming period for the, the salaries that you're paying. For periods two and onwards, it's a very similar test. The only difference is the required reduction in revenue is 30% instead of 15%. And the reasoning for that is that a lot of businesses uh, didn't start feeling the impact of uh, this uh, pandemic until partway through March. So they relaxed the rules in March to 15%. But going forward, it's a 30% test. Same sort of thing for April 2020. You can look at April 2019's revenues or the average of January and February 2020. Uh, two important things to note. Uh, once you pick your prior reference period, so whether you're going to use the, the prior month in 2019 or the average of January and February of 2020, you have to stay consistent for each period and use that as your reference period. And another important point is uh, the legislation allows for uh, one additional period of qualification. So what that means is if you qualify for March, you meet the 15% revenue reduction, regardless of what your April numbers look like, you qualify for April automatically. Uh, it's only a one period extension. So if you want to qualify for May, you have to re-qualify for May. And the way you would do that is either your May revenues have gone down the required 30% or your April revenues have gone down the 30% because then you automatically will qualify for May as well. And uh, even though there's an automatic qualification, the, uh, the application is done on a period by period basis. So you do have to apply for each period separately. And I'll go into the, call, the uh, how to apply in a, in a few slides. So this revenue test, again, as I mentioned, uh, you do have to pick one reference period and stick to it. If you were not carrying on business last year, as of March 1st, 2019, uh, you have, unfortunately, you have no choice and you do have to use the January, February average revenue for your comparative uh, throughout this, uh, the revenue test uh, and each qualifying period. So what is revenue? Uh, so generally it's uh, very similar to uh, 
your a tax return for an entity. So taxes are in Canada are calculated on an entity by entity basis. Uh, revenue is also done the same. Uh, it's really meant to cover operating income. So income earned from the sale of goods, uh, provision of services, uh, use of resources uh, in Canada. So you can be selling to someone outside of Canada, but the, uh, the actual provision of the service or use of resources has to be in Canada. Uh, a general rule of thumb is if you're paying tax in Canada on that income, uh, you probably qualify, but if you have a unique situation, uh, definitely recommend it to talk it through with your tax advisor as uh, there could be some gray areas depending on the situation. Uh, the revenue does in, uh, excludes extraordinary items, so things that are not normal to your operations uh, can be excluded. Uh, it excludes any of the subsidies that you've received. Uh, and one big exclusion is it does exclude any amounts derived from non-arm's length related person, length persons or partnerships. And what that means is really anyone that you're related to, uh, if you have a corporate structure where you're, you have all your revenues coming from a company that's related, uh, so say there's this, the same shareholder at the top or something like that, uh, those revenues are not eligible to be counted for either the current period or the prior period. So you have to qualify without those revenues being counted. If you have a unique situation where more than 90% of your revenue is from these non-arms-like sources, uh, there are some ele elections available where you may be able to qualify. Uh, and there's also a consolidated basis election where you may be able to uh, combine revenues of a corporate group together. Uh, these elections are very complex and the, the formulas, again, are very convoluted to go through. Uh, so if you're in this situation, I definitely recommend uh, seeking advice, talking to a tax specialist, and uh, going through these calculations to see if you're qualified. One other election that is available that may help some employers is that you can use the cash method for determining your revenues. Uh, so regardless of how you prepare your financial statements, you could run a separate calculation look at all cash receipts received and use that as your basis from, for calculating revenue, regardless of what your revenue recognition policies are. And again, similar to everything else, once you've chosen to use the cash basis, you have to use it for every period and you have to be consistent across everything. So March 2020, if that's on a cash basis, whether it's March 2019 or the average of January, February 2020, those also have to be on the cash basis. So you're, you're comparing the same thing. So everybody's big question is, well, that's great. How do I apply for this? And uh, just released this week, they did mention that uh, the application process is going to be available uh, on Monday, April 27th. Uh, there's going to be three ways to apply. Uh, if you have Canada Revenue Agency's My Business Account access, uh, you can do so on that portal. Uh, there will also be a web-based application. I believe that you're going to need a web access code. Uh, there should be instructions on the CRA's website in terms of how to obtain that if you don't have your web access code. I believe the process is fairly straightforward to get one of those. Uh, and alternatively, there's CRA's Representative Client Service. So if you have someone that represents your company and they have access through there, they can, are able to apply as well. I think when you're making the decision as to who should apply for this, uh, you will need your financial information and details on your employees, the wages you're paying and your revenue decreases. So it, it may make more practical sense for someone inside your organization to be doing this rather than a representative, but the option is there if you do need uh, kind of your accountant or your tax advisor to uh, who has access to this service to do the, the application uh, with you, uh, they can do it through there if, if needed and it makes sense for your business. As part of the application, you do need to uh, attest that you have maintained records that demonstrate your reduction in revenue and that the test has been met and the remuneration you paid to employees. Uh, CRA uh, has also just released a, a calculator uh, that you can you can download an Excel file and actually put your employee detail in, and it should calculate the subsidy that's available to you. Uh, the link is here. Uh, again, I, I just tried to I 
Googled it, and uh, if you type in CEWS calculator, uh, it's the first hit that comes up. So you can look there or you can go to the link that's on the slide. Uh, some other information about the application process. Uh, the employer has to attest that the decline in revenue has been met and all other conditions have been met. So there's a self-certification process when you apply. And as was mentioned before, uh, the government does want employers to continue to pay the employees uh, baseline remuneration. So what they were making before the crisis, if possible, but there's nothing in the legislation that forces you to do so. Uh, in that example before, if you, if you remember, there was the employee who made $2,000 a week. Uh, they were dropped down to 750. So def definitely not paying them the same as before. And you still got the full 750 reimbursed as the subsidy. So that may not impact the subsidy, but the government does want employers to try and top up employees if they can. And the subsidy, of course, it's taxable. So you pay the salary to the employees. So there's a, a salary expense on your books the wage subsidy will decrease that salary expense. So you're only really getting the write-off for the amount that you're out of pocket for. And if you've been listening to Trudeau's uh, talks every day when they announce this, uh, they, they are taking this very seriously and anyone who tries to abuse this program, there's uh, quite severe pen penalties that could apply. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, if it's determined after the fact that employers have claimed this subsidy and they don't meet the eligibility requirements, uh, first of all, you'll have to repay 100% of the, the amount of it. Uh, there's also an anti-avoidance penalty where if employers are engaging in artificial transactions to try and get under that 15% or 30% threshold when they really shouldn't be entitled to the subsidy, uh, there's an additional 25% penalty on top of having to repay the subsidy. Uh, further to that, if there's any sort of fraudulent claims being made, uh, really serious abuse of the program, uh, there could be penalties of gross negligence, which could be another 100% of the amount owing. So you could be looking at something as bad as 225% uh, of the amount if you're into those situations where you're, you're really abusing the program. Uh, even imprisonment is a possibility. And the minister does have the ability to make the information of people who have claimed this amount public. So there is a bit of kind of public shaming and reputational risk to employers. Uh, I think the, the message is that uh, if you're entitled to this program and you are someone who's struggling and meet all the criteria, please apply for this program. They, the government wants you to take advantage of this. But for employers who are trying to be sneaky or trying to get cute with the numbers, uh, just be warned that there are severe consequences if you shouldn't qualify otherwise. So that's the end of the bulk of my presentation on the 75% subsidy. I'll just go through the other uh, programs at a high level just to make sure you're aware of what else is out there. Uh, the, the one I alluded to earlier was the, the temporary wage subsidy. Uh, this was the original 10% subsidy that was announced before the 75% subsidy. Uh, it's still there and uh, employers who are eligible can still claim it. As I mentioned, any amounts you claim under this will reduce what you can claim under the subsidy for that same employee. And it's really anyone who employs one or more individuals in Canada. If you have an existing business number and a payroll account as of March 18th, and you pay salaries to an employee. Uh, and just a uh, a note for the 75% subsidy, you also need to, needed to have had a payroll account as of March 15th when the program started. Uh, so this uh, prevents uh, people from never having a payroll account before to setting up a payroll account now and taking advantage of the subsidy. Uh, so unfortunately, new businesses could be out of luck here. You do have to have had that payroll account as of March 15th and for this one as of March 18th. Uh, this, the temporary wage subsidy is much more restrictive as to who can qualify. Uh, it's only can Canadian controlled private corporations that are eligible for the small business deduction. Uh, there are some nuances in that, but essentially if you're taxable capital, which is your retained earnings and your debt, uh, there's, there's some more 
uh, technicalities to that, but at a high level, that's what it is. If it's less than 15 million, you should be eligible for this if you're claiming part of the small business deduction. Uh, other entities with payroll account numbers uh, that are individuals or partnerships or not-for-profits or charities could also qualify. And how it's calculated is it's 10% of the remuneration paid between March 18th and June 19th. And the max you can claim during this period is $13.75 per employee. And you can never claim more than $25,000 per employer uh, as part of this program. And uh, if you have multiple companies that have payroll in an in a associated group, uh, you actually have a $25,000 limit per company. It's not shared, uh, similar to other things like the small business deduction. Uh, there's no reduction to the remittance of CPP and EI premiums. So what that, what that means is uh, when the way this subsidy is claimed is uh, you pay your employees as usual, and then when you go to pay your remittances to CRA, uh, you're eligible to reduce any income tax withheld by the amount of the subsidy. So you can only reduce the income tax with health, you can't reduce the CDP or EI. And of course the subsidy is taxable, so it would reduce, uh, reduce any uh, salary expense that you've claimed. As a numerical example, there, if you had five employees, they'd each earn $4,100 a month. Uh, your total payroll cost is 20,500. Your subsidy is equal to 10% of that amount, so 2,050. Uh, over the three-month period, the total subsidy would be 6150 uh, If you look at that number, that's less than the $25,000 max, so you are entitled to the full amount. And 6150 divided by the five employees is less than the $1,375 per each employee, so you're not capped there as well. So a few other programs just to mention, I have discuss the, uh, the CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, briefly as part of the subsidy. Uh, this has been around for a while. This is the $2,000 a month payment. This was the first one of the first programs that was introduced. Uh, the criteria was that uh, if workers have sought, ceased working and are without employment or self-employment for reasons related to COVID-19, they are eligible for this payment. Uh, there was a new change to this rule announced just uh, fairly recently where individuals can now earn up to $1,000 in each four week period that, and they can still be eligible for the CERT. Uh, unfortunately, that's a hard line. So if someone's making 1,000 on the dot, you can claim the 2,000 a month if you otherwise qualify. As soon as you're over that, if you're making $1,001, unfortunately you get zero. So that's as it is right now, that may change in the future, but there is no grind down, it's an all or nothing claim. Uh, it's similar to the subsidy, it's claimed in uh, four week periods and it's $2,000 per month or $500 per week. And the maximum you can claim is uh, 16 weeks total. So four different periods that you can apply for between March 15th and October 3rd. And you have to apply before December 2nd in order to receive the benefit. And uh, one other criteria is you do have to have been earning income before uh, you, before all of this happened. Uh, you need, there's a $5,000 threshold of either employment income, self-employment income, or non-eligible dividends if someone's a shareholder. Uh, you need at least $5,000 in the last 12 months or in 2019 to apply for this. The last program I wanted to talk about is the, uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account or the CBA. Uh, there are some other loan programs that have been announced for the BDC, from the BDC and the EDC. And uh, if you're a company looking for larger amounts of financing, I'd encourage you to look at these programs as they may be uh, beneficial to you. I just wanted to focus on the one that's mainly for small businesses and that will impact the most, uh, the most individuals or employers. What this loan is, is it's an interest-free loan of up to $40,000. And the purpose of the loan is to pay non-deferrable operating costs. And the examples provided are payroll, rent, utilities, insurance, property tax, regular debt payments. 
Uh, you cannot use the money to pay dividends to shareholders, uh, increases in management compensation or prepaying existing debt that you have. And other than the use of the funds, the only other qualification is that in 2019, you had to have had payroll between 20,000 and 1.5 million. And that comes straight from your T4 summary. Uh, similarly to the other programs, this is a hard line test. Uh, you, if you need to be between those numbers, there's no rounding or anything. And if you're between those numbers, you should qualify for the loan. Uh, unfortunately, if you didn't have payroll in 2019 or you don't meet the thresholds, uh, you don't qualify for this program as it stands right now. Uh, again, changes are being made frequently, so that could change. Uh, if you do repay the loan before December 31st, 2022, there is a 25% debt forgiveness uh, up to $10,000. So if you repaid $30,000 before the end of 2022, you'd get the $10,000 forgiven. There's no interest during that initial term, and then there'd be 5% on any remaining amount uh, during the extended term after 2022. And this one can be applied directly through your financial institution's website. So whoever you do your business banking with already, that's the bank you go to to apply for this loan. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, there's been a lot of changes over the last few weeks and it can be very confusing and complex. And hopefully this has given you a better idea as to what's out there. And I'll uh, pass it back to Kelsey. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob, for that. I know uh, all of our attendees were listening intently as you went over a lot of the nitty gritty that, uh, quite frankly, is not within our purview nor our area of expertise as lawyers. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have a separate Q&A recording that will be accessible, um, dealing with a number of questions that came in through the course of the webinar. We are also working on getting a, a manner of distribution for all of the typed and written questions that came through the written Q&A during the webinar, and we'll make sure that we do our best to get those out to all attendees. But uh, you know, the easiest thing to do is, first of all, you can access this presentation, and I'll put up that information in a second, but reach out to Jacob if you've got questions on that side reach out to Susan, Mike, or me, or anybody at CC Partners, and uh, ask your questions, get the advice that you need to make the right decisions. None of these things are easy, and uh, as we've all mentioned, and we, everybody out there has realized, things are changing on a regular basis, and uh, it's all about doing the best with what you've got at the time, and making sure that you're not exposing your organization to any liability or risk that's unnecessary. So uh, as we play out, so to speak, without any actual exit music, I'm going to leave you with the contact information for CCP. And um, you've got Jacob's information. So I wanted to thank our panelists. Jacob, thank you so much for everything and not just on this, but the uh, advice and assistance you've given us in the course of things. And uh, Mike and Susan, thank you both as well. Great, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you everyone. Stay safe, stay well, and good luck. Good job, everyone.